We're returning in our preaching series to the book of Acts. And so if you have the book of the book of the Bible, if you have the Bible in front of you, you can open it to the book of Acts. And we'll have an opportunity this morning to take a look at uh, a passage in Acts chapter 13 together. Uh, If you're using a pew Bible, you'll find this on uh, page 921, and so I encourage you to follow along in your Bible if you have it in front of you. I will have the text up on the screens for you as well. Before I get into the passage this morning, I want to share with you just a, a story that I was reading about, about the work that God is doing around the world today. Well, a couple of years ago, but in our day. And this story takes place in the um, country of India, in the state of Bihar. I didn't know where Bihar, India is. Maybe you do if you're better with your Indian geography. It is in the northern part of the country, uh, right up next to the border of Nepal. And in this part of Bihar, uh, this part of India, uh, it's a size of uh, land that is approximate to the size of the state of Ohio, for your perspective. The difference is Ohio has about 11 million people living in it, and Bihar, India has about 125 million people living in it. There's a lot of people there. And in addition to there being a lot of people there, there is also um, a very small representation of a gospel witness, of a Christian witness in this part of the land. 83% of the world, of the land there, and uh, the people there in Bihar, India, are Buddhists. 83% are Buddhists. 17% are Muslim. You say 83 and 17. That's pretty close to 100. Yeah, the gospel witness in Bihar about five years ago was 0.1% of the population. Not a lot of people at all who knew or claimed the name of Christ. In fact, in the the over 45,000 villages that make up the state of Bihar, India, there was a very small gospel influence in this part of the country. Well, the story goes uh, that uh, there was two men who were uh, Christians who were living in that area. One of them was a school administrator, and the other one was a chicken farmer. And they were both Christians, and they were uh, talking together about how to share the gospel in their community, and they were trying to be faithful witnesses in the place where God had, had set them. And, and uh, it seemed that over time, nothing was really breaking through. They weren't They weren't turning any new ground. They were running into opposition and frustration and even some persecution. But um, they went to this training uh, opportunity that was offered to them. And the way that the trainers taught them was to open the Bible to Luke chapter 10 and to see Jesus sending out his disciples two by two. And so the trainer said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to send you out two by two. And so the school administrator and the chicken farmer were paired together, and they were told, we're going to go from journey to journey, uh, village to village. We're going to walk from village to village. And as you go, you're going to be looking for somebody who's receptive to you being there. And so these two guys are like, this is... this." this can't work. Like the, We've tried a lot of things, and, and, and you're asking us just to walk into a village and look for somebody who's receptive? And the trainer said, yeah, that's what I want you to do. In fact, when you go there, I want you to ask a question, and, and you, I want you to say, uh, we, are, we are here representing the name of Jesus Christ, and we care about you and your village. Is there anything that we can pray for you about? And the two guys were like, this can't have any fruit. This won't, this won't work. But nothing that we've done has worked either, and so maybe we should just go ahead and try it. And so they decide to go out into the villages, and sure enough, they go through a couple villages and without much interaction or traction, but they'd make it to one village, and they go through the town, and at the other end of the town, they come to a man who uh, uh, is open to a conversation with them. And so they say to him, kind of looking at each other, I guess this is our opportunity, um, we come representing the name of Jesus, and, we, and just as they said the name Jesus, the man stopped them and said, did you just say Jesus? I've heard of that guy. Would you be willing to tell me more about who he is? And they said, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we'd love to be able to do. And so they began to talk to him about who Jesus was, and two minutes into the conversation, he stopped them. 
And he's, the two guys thought, well, he must not be interested. And he said, I, 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 I want to stop you right now because I'm interested in getting my whole family and community together so that we can hear this together. Would you be open to me just pausing you for a second so that I can go get everybody together and we can meet together and you can tell us about this Jesus? And they looked at one another and said, yeah, this sounds like a really good idea. And so they, they went to his house and they waited and the guy brought a community of people together and they began to tell the story of Jesus. And they went back the next day, and over two weeks, 20 people in this village committed their lives to faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? But the story doesn't stop there, because after a couple of weeks and months of them meeting together, the two guys said, you know, here's what we're going to do. You're going to pair up, each of you. You're going to go to village to village, and you're going to ask the same question to the villages around you. You're going to walk into them and you're going to say, um, we come in the name of Jesus and we want to know if there's anything we can pray for for you, if there's anything that we can pray for your village about. And over three years, 350 churches were planted in Bihar, India with this method of people just walking into a village and saying, what can I pray for you about? I come in the name of Jesus. And I read those kind of stories and I get chills I think, praise God, that's so awesome. I love to hear what that, how that's working and what God is doing. And, and I get excited. And then I look around my current situation and I go, God, would you do that here? Would you do it among us? What would it look like for the hundreds who are gathered here to be intentional witnesses in our community asking people a simple question? I come bearing the name of Jesus, and I'm just wondering, is there anything that I can pray for you about? Is there anything that I can do for you? And I think about a church that would have that kind of dynamic power, that kind of dynamic movement in, it, in its area, and it, it reminds me of what I read about in Acts chapter 13. It reminds me of this church uh, at a city called Antioch that decided in the very first church in the, in the gospel account or in the, the book of Acts, the very first church congregation that decided we're going to intentionally send missionaries out from here. What a novel concept. Up until this time, God has been working in the book of Acts. We've been talking about gospel power. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit, which comes with power. We've been talking about the ability to have life over death, for uh, health to come to those who are sick, for prayer, for the intercession. We've seen the gospel go out to Samaria. We've seen the gospel go out to a Roman family. We've seen all these different instances where the gospel is moving. But here in Acts chapter 13, the book takes a turn. And it's no longer about Peter and the apostles that are down in Jerusalem. Now we begin to see this guy who was named Saul, who we're going to become known as Paul, and we're going to see the work that he does as he and his traveling companions are sent out. They're sent out. And I want to ask the question this morning, is there anything that we can learn from them? Is there anything that we can learn from this church And so I want you to read with me Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, and I'm going to invite you to stand if you'd like to. Again, as recognizing that this is God's word now, not Jeff's, this is what God has to say to us, chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had John, who was there to assist them. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus. He was was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But 
Elymas, or Bar-Jesus, he was also called Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you who are full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. You may be seated. And as you're seated, Father, we ask that you would move in our hearts in such a way so as to awaken us to the power of your Holy Spirit and the testimony that is ours in the world in which we live. Father, would you give us meaning, purpose, focus, commitment, faithfulness, discipline to the things that you have called us to do, for the lives that you have called us to live, for the faithfulness that you have asked us to walk in, And ultimately, Father, may we not do any of those things as some sort of checkbox, as though doing them somehow makes you happy, but rather would we do them because of our great love for you, our motivation for doing the things that you have called us to, because we love you, because we desire to honor you with our lives. Father, move in us as you moved in Cyprus. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And so we're going to look this morning at five characteristics or five lessons from the church at Antioch, five lessons from the church at Antioch. And if you want to write these down, you can follow along. The longer title would be five characteristics of a church that is faithfully walking on the path of the gospel. Five characteristics of a church that is faithfully walking this path of the gospel and what God is calling us to. This is an interesting text of scripture, obviously, especially Paul's confrontation with this man, Elymas. I don't recommend his tactic necessarily, although there may be a time for that kind of confrontation. The first thing that I want want us to see about this church is that they were united around the Word of God. They were united around the Word of God. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, look at the text with me. It says, there was in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Prophets, those whose job it was to hear from the Lord and proclaim to those who were listening that which God had communicated, and teachers, those who could take the law that was already written down, in their case it was the Old Testament, and interpret it and teach it in such a way so that as the people could understand it. Within this church, there was a faithful group of prophets who would speak the truth of God and teachers who would teach the word of God to the church that was gathered there. Five names are mentioned. Let's talk about each of them just for a moment. The first one mentioned is Barnabas. Barnabas becomes a traveling companion of Paul. We'll look at him in a lot of detail as we go, but here's what we know about Barnabas. His real name, or his given name, was Joseph, and he was given the name Barnabas by the disciples in Acts chapter 4. And the name Barnabas means one who brings encouragement or a son of encouragement. And the reason, or part of the reason, likely why the disciples gave him the name Barnabas is because he brought his land and that which was given to him by birthright and sold it and brought the proceedings or the, the, um, the offering before the disciples and said, use it however you will. It says in Acts chapter 4 that 
This Joseph or this Barnabas was from the land of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, and he was a Jew, and he was a Levite, which means he was of the tribe of the priests. And he was one who was converted to faith in Jesus Christ early in the book of Acts and brings a sacrifice and becomes an encourager in the early church there in Jerusalem. The next guy that's mentioned is a guy by the name of Simeon, who was called Niger. Niger is a Latin word, which means dark or black, giving most people the, in, uh, the guess that this was a dark-skinned man, likely from Africa, who was there in Antioch and part of this fellowship. The third person mentioned is Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is in Libya, also in northern Africa. You might remember Cyrene from Simon the Cyrene, the man who carried the cross for Jesus at his crucifixion. This area of northern Africa, there was a Jewish settlement there as well. And so the teachings of the Old Testament were present all over the world because of the way in which the Jews had been dispersed under the, um, the, the Greek uh, world and the Roman world in which they were living. And so here from northern Africa in the land of Cyrene, there is this man named Lucius. The fourth guy mentioned is a guy by the name of Menaean. Menaean, interestingly, is a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch. Other translations say that he was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Now, Herod may ring some bells for you. There's a lot of Herods in the New Testament, and so sometimes it's confusing to remember which one did which, but Herod the Tetrarch was the guy who had John the Baptist executed. He's the one who um, called for John the Baptist to have his head removed from his body because John the Baptist confronted him on his immoral lifestyle. John, uh, Herod the Tetrarch was also the Herod that was present during the time of Jesus' trials before his crucifixion. And here, a member of his court or a lifelong friend or a close associate, it's difficult sometimes to translate exactly the relationship, but this one by the name of Menaean now is here as a teacher in Antioch as well. And then the fifth one that's mentioned is Saul. And we know more about Saul than any of them, but Saul was from the land of Tarsus. He was a Jewish rabbi. He was a teacher. He was a Pharisee. He sat under the great teacher Gamaliel, and he was one who, until a few years before this, was intent on eliminating the movement called Christianity. He was intent on killing and imprisoning Christians. What a gathering of teachers. What a gathering of leaders in this church. Friends of Herod, former persecutors, people from Africa, a man from Cyprus who was an encouragement in the church in Jerusalem, and yet these are the ones who had been gathered to teach the word of God. If you look back in your Bible to Acts chapter 11, just flip back a page, this is not on the screen. But in Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 19, we'll see some more about this church at Antioch. It says, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen's martyrdom traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, Two, men, two places that are mentioned here among these five teachers, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, those are the Greek-speaking Jews, preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and so they sent Barnabas from Jerusalem up to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. And so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch as well. And for a whole year, they met with the church, and they taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. 
That's a cool story. Nice little background to help us fill in the color that's, a, that's around this church in Antioch. This church in Antioch was a relational, disciple-making church, which is exactly what we just spent five weeks talking about at Redwood Chapel, what we want to be. A church that gathers and has relationship with one another. A church that gathers and has relationship with one another for a purpose, and the purpose is making new disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. This is what Antioch was all about. It was a relational disciple-making church. They walked together. They did life together. They sat under the teaching of people who were faithful to God's word. They were committed and united around the word of God. Notice what they are united around. They're not united around Jerusalem. They're not united around a temple. They're not united around Caesar They're not united around the fact that they are Jewish. They're united around the word of God. They're united around what God has proclaimed to them through the preachers, through the prophets, through the teachers that were in their midst. May it be true of us that what unites us in this room is the word of God. Amen? We do not come with an agenda of our personal politic in this room. We all have one, but that's not what unites us. We don't gather in this room around a particular ethnicity. That's not why we're here. We don't gather in this room for any other reason than a common awareness that we have. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the awareness that you have is that you are a sinner who is in need of a Savior. That's why you're here. You're a sinner. And what do I mean by a sinner but one who is broken, really, at the core? One who recognizes that their own good works are but filthy rags because of the hole that is in your heart because of the holiness of the God that we are pursuing, we gather here because we recognize that we're broken. And that in coming here, we come to encourage one another around the word of God and point to a common need. If we're all broken, what do we all need? To be fixed. We all need salvation. Broken people need to be healed. This is why I believe so many miracles took place in the Bible, because they were outward demonstrations of what Jesus was able to do inside the hearts and lives of people. Remember, he says to the man who is paralyzed, your sins are forgiven. And they don't like that. And he says, what's harder, to say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your mat and walk home? To show you that I have the ability to do the first one, I'm going to say the second one as well. I'm going to do the outward miracle so that you can see that what I am saying about the heart is true. We're a gathered people who are broken. And my encouragement to us as a church is that we would learn to be aware of our brokenness in a way that gives us compassion for ourselves and compassion for the people who are in the pews with us. Because none of us come to this place completely whole. Redeemed, yes, but not finally redeemed. Forgiven, yes, but not free from the bondage of sin that still plagues us here in this world. We have a common need about a common awareness And so we gather with a common love. That love is that we're going to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we're going to love each other as though we were loving ourselves. That's sacrificial love. It's intentional love. It's purposeful love. But it's a love that is motivated not simply by what I get out of it. It's a love that's motivated by the fact that I have a need that only God can fix. And because he's willing to fix it, I'm going to love him and love you. Amen? That's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful reason to gather. I have a need. God can deal with my need. And as a result of God dealing with my need, I have an opportunity to love somebody else. 
with the goal that they will have their need revealed as well and that their heart will be changed, which gives us a common message. And that common message is the gospel that we've been talking about. This salvation that is found in Jesus that frees us from our past, secures for us a future, and gives us reason to work in the restoration of God's project here on this earth. That's why we're here. Church, don't ever miss that. I know that you love to see each other. I know that you love to gather. I know that you love to have your fellowship together. All that is good. But it's more than that. It's what God is calling us to, the mission that he's given us, and it's because we are united around the word of God. Number two, this church was committed to worship. They were committed to worship. There was in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, he names who they are, and look at what he says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke. They were committed to worship. Worship was their foundation. Our witness to the world is born in the worship of the church. You could put it this way. People, on the next slide, it says, people who are passionate about exalting the glory of God will be passionate about spreading the gospel of God. People who are passionate about exalting the glory of God will be passionate about spreading the gospel of God. They gathered to worship. Their reason was to worship because they understood that their worship of Almighty God led to their witness in the world. We just sang worship songs. Now, singing is not the only way that we worship, but it's a way that we worship. And we just sang my chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, who is my Savior, has rescued me. And, and, and like a flood, his mercy reigns. Amazing love. Amazing. We just sang that, right? And you were, yeah, yes, I feel that. I sing that. Yes. But what if we walk out of here and we go, oh, that was good. I'm glad that we sang that song today. And we never live as though our chains are gone. Or we never tell anybody that my chains are gone. My addiction, it's behind me. God freed me from it. I've been set free. The things that I struggle with in this world, the fear, the anxiety, the things that are heavy on my life, God has freed me from those things. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. He's bought me back. Boy, we sing these songs, but, but do we walk out of here with any intentionality of letting our worship turn into witness? I'm not saying stand on the street corner and sing Amazing Grace to all those who are driving by. That's not my point. My point is, is are you living your life in such a way outside the walls of this church that somebody who came up to you could say, that person seems different. They seem free. They seem lighter. They seem like they have their eye on something that is giving them hope. They don't feel so encumbered by this world. They're not weighed down. They're not in despair. They're not in distress. Rather, they love they love freely. What a beautiful thing to allow our worship to turn into a witness in our community. And why, why do we need this? Because we live in a lost world. Do you realize that? This world is lost. This world largely does not know Jesus. Statistically, there are 1.8 billion Muslims in our world 1.2 billion who don't claim any religion, 1.1 billion Hindus, 500 million Buddhists. There are people all around us who are searching for answers, and you and I know somebody who has said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And no one will ever get to the Father unless they come through me. Why, church, would we not share that message? 
Why would we be timid about that? I come to you representing Jesus. Can I pray for you about anything in your life? Is there anything that I can do for you? I want to demonstrate to you love because God has loved me. He has freed me. And I want my worship to be a witness to his goodness in me. These people in Antioch worshiped the Lord and fasted. And number three, they were obedient and open-handed. They were obedient and open-handed. Because the Holy Spirit comes and says to them, now, I don't know about you, but when I read stuff like that in the Bible, I have to just kind of stop and go, what was that like? <laughs> How did the Holy Spirit do that? Did he, did he say it to you? Did you hear his voice? Did he impress upon you? Did you feel convicted about something? Was there an agreement in your prayer and in your fasting? I, I just want to know. I, I have to be honest with you. I wish in some instances when I read the Bible that I was a fly on the wall to discern what in the world was happening in that room at the time. But what the Bible says here is that they were praying, that is that their attention was on God, they were fasting, that is they were letting go of some of the things in this world in order to have their attention on God. These are spiritual disciplines and part of their worship and they were done for a reason. And, and while that is happening, the Holy Spirit says to them or impresses upon them or leads them to a decision and the, and the, or to a statement, and that statement is, I want you to set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, Barnabas and Saul, we just identified, were two of the five members of their preaching team. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the one who came from Jerusalem in order to encourage us over a year ago of whom we've lived and love. And Saul, that persecutor of the church who has been transformed. And, and man, he's got such a great history and knowledge of the Old Testament. He's been such a great teacher for us. Are you sure, Holy Spirit, that you want Barnabas and Saul to go? Are you sure that you didn't say Joe and Steve? Because It'd be really easy to let Joe and Steve go, but Barnabas and Saul are important to what we're doing here now in Antioch. No, they were open-handed with what God had given them. And they were obedient to what God had given them. And even if that meant that their very best leaders would leave, they said, okay. And they pray, and they fast some more, and they send them out. And that's the process. You see there in verse 3, after more fasting and praying, they lay their hands on them and they send them off. They fast, they pray, they identify, they fast, they pray some more, they lay hands on, and then they send. These lessons that we can learn from this church are real for us today. Are we unified around the word of God are we a people who are committed to worship that leads us into a witness? Are we obedient and open-handed with the things that God has called us to? Number four, they were strategic and purposeful. They were strategic and they were purposeful. So, verse four, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from here they sailed to Cyprus. These places actually exist. Look at a map. Seleucia, Syria, over there on the bottom right, is north of Jerusalem. It's north of the Sea of Galilee. It's up there in the modern area of Syria. Antioch is a land that is, or a city that is inland. There's a river that comes down to Seleucia. Seleucia is a port city. And there they go from Antioch down to Seleucia and they set sail for Cyprus. Cyprus, this island in the middle of the Mediterranean. If you're going to go on a missions trip, you might as well go to an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's a beautiful spot, but it's not why they went there. They were being purposeful and strategic. What's purposeful and strategic about Cyprus? But Barnabas is from there. That's Barnabas' home. Hey, God's called us to go out somewhere. Where should we go? I don't know. Let's go to the people that I know. 
I'm, I, I've got a burning for that, for that land. I, I want to see them come to know Jesus. Let's go talk to those people. And so they go out to Cyprus, and they land in the area of Salamis. And what do they do in Salamis? They strategically move to the synagogues. And why would they do that? Well, maybe we kind of get along with these people. Maybe we'll have an open. No, strategically, Paul was a rabbi. Paul was a Pharisee. And the, and the custom of the day was that if a Pharisee or a teacher walked into a synagogue, that those who were the rulers of that synagogue would defer to the guest and allow them an opportunity to expound upon the Scriptures. Well, why wouldn't Paul go there? Hey, we've got a natural audience over here. We walk in, I show them my ID card. We're good. They can read any passage of the Old Testament and I'm going to get them to Jesus. That's what Paul would do. He would take every opportunity to point them to Jesus. And so all through Paul's ministry, when he goes city to city to city to city, the reason why he goes to synagogue first is because he was welcomed there as a member of the ruling class. He was likely a member of the Sanhedrin. I mean, Paul had credential. And here is this local man, a man from Cyprus with his traveling companion who's a religious authority, and they've got John Mark with them. And who's John Mark anyway? But earlier in the book of Acts, John Mark is identified in Acts chapter 9 as the son of Mary who Peter uh, went to after he got out of prison. And then he goes with Barnabas up to Antioch, and then he goes and travels with Paul. John Mark probably saw Jesus with his own eyes and interacted with him as one who was around the disciples when he was a younger man. And you've got three guys with credentials that have been sent out. Three guys with connections. They were strategic and they were purposeful with where God was sending them. And the question that we can learn from that is, how do we become strategic with what God's given us? How do we become purposeful with what we have? We have a building, we have gifts, we have resources, we have opportunity. How do we use that to see the gospel move forward? Paul also went to the synagogues because of something that he wrote in Romans chapter 1, where he says in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul recognized that the law had been given to the Jews, and he knew and understood the Jewish mind in such a way that it compelled him to see that they heard the gospel first. Now, oftentimes, those Jewish people rejected Paul. Paul, and it was the Gentiles around who were intrigued by what Paul was saying and ultimately came to faith, and that's exactly what happens here, because the fifth thing that we see is that they were enabled by the power of God. They were enabled by the power of God, which led to a tremendous amount of boldness, as we read earlier. I'll look at it again with you. They had John there to assist them. It says in verse 6 of chapter 13, when they'd gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, that is from one side of the island to the other, they came upon this certain magician, this Jewish guy, a false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, Bar-Jesus is simply a conflation of two names. It means the son of Jesus, and it's not referring to Jesus of Nazareth. If you didn't know, the name Jesus was very common in Jesus' day. It's a, it's a Greek version of the Hebrew word Joshua, and it was very common for people to be named Jesus. While there might have been many people named Jesus, there is, of course, only one Messiah named Jesus. And this bar Jesus, who we read about in Acts 13, has no connection to our Messiah. Rather, he's a magician. He's one who practices divination. He's one who plays around with the arts, and he's one who has been garnered himself an audience with the ruler of Cyprus, the proconsul, which is another way of saying the governor. And so it says that he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. This Sergius Paulus, we can find him in modern history books uh, about uh, this area of Cyprus. There are literal inscriptions that have been found on Cyprus and in other places that have the name Sergius Paulus on them from around this time, around the mid-40s A.D. Amazing the way in which 
history and the way in which uh, geography um, and the way in which archaeology reveals the truth of Scripture. Now, these are non-Christian people who are just excavating old ruins, and they come across a guy who's a proconsul on Cyprus in around 48 AD by the name of Sergius Paulus. This is exactly who is being referred to in verse 13. He's interested, he's intrigued, he wants an audience with Barnabas and Saul, but Elymas, the guy's other name, don't associate him with Jesus anymore. Luke, the author, is like, I don't want to give him even the name Bar-Jesus. I'm going to call him Elymas because that's what his name means. It means magician. He opposed them and he sought to turn the proconsul away from the faith. The harshest words in the Bible are reserved for those who seek to turn other people away from the faith. Over and over and over again, the warning is clear to false teachers. The warning is clear to the Pharisees. The warning is clear to any who would erect an obstacle in the path of somebody else desiring to know who Jesus is. This warning is clear, don't do this. And you can see Saul recognizing what Elymas is up to and recognizing that he is not going to allow this to happen. And so what does Saul say to him? It says that he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he looks intently at him. I can only imagine what his gaze must have looked like at that moment. And he spoke to him, you son of the devil, you enemy of all that is righteous, you who are full of deceit and villainy, will you stop? Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? The journey to salvation is clear. The, the way to Jesus is clear. The Bible says that the, that the gate is narrow, that the path is narrow. There are few who will enter through it. And wide is the road that leads to destruction, but, but it's clear. It's straight. Repent. Believe. Trust. Obey. Worship. But anybody who seeks to put an impediment in that path is going to be confronted. And Jesus did this with the religious leaders in his day. He talked about the religious leaders and he gave them a pretty serious tongue lashing in Matthew chapter 23. He said, they tell you what to do, but they don't do the things that they preach. They tie up heavy burdens over you, things that are hard to bear, and they lay them on top of your shoulders. This is not the way of Jesus to lay a heavy burden on somebody else. They do things to be seen by others because they want everybody to pay attention to them. Matthew 23, verse 13, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter it yourself nor will you allow others to go in. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You travel across the sea and land to make a single follower. And when he becomes a follower, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Verse 23, You tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin. And you have neglected the weightier matters of the law like justice and mercy and faithfulness. Your blind guides, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. Woe to you, verse 25. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. You are spiritual leaders, but you are erecting impediments to the gospel, to the truth. And you better be careful. And this is exactly what Paul is saying to Elymas. You better be careful because you are creating a crooked path where it should be straight. And as a result, the Lord's going to take your sight away. Now, you have to think that Paul just a few years earlier was traveling to Damascus in order to create impediments to people coming to know Jesus I mean, his impediment was, I'm going to take your life or I'm going to put you in prison. I don't want you to know him. And what does the Lord Jesus do to him on that road but blind him 
in order to wake him up. And maybe Paul is thinking, look, it worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call down blindness on you in order that you will not see so that this gospel message can go forward. I don't know that that's what happened, but I can't help but think there's a pretty good little connection there. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that this has the same effect on Elemis, but it does have a pretty good effect on Sergius Paulus because the governor sees what Paul has done, and the proconsul believed. And when he saw what had occurred, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord because this crooked path was suddenly made straight for him, and he was given an opportunity to see Jesus with his own eyes. What opportunity do you and I have as a church to get united around the Word of God, to be committed to worship that leads to witness, to live sacrificially, obediently, and open-handed, to be strategic and purposeful with what God has called us to, and to be enabled by the power of God to be a witness in this world. What a beautiful gift God has given us. This is not just religious duty. This is a calling on us. This is not just going through motions. This is information for the purpose of transformation in our societies. And it's an opportunity that God has given us to remember what Jesus has done for us. And so as we move into this time of communion and we think about the Lord's Supper, we recall that Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and cup. And he said, the bread represents my body, which is broken for you, and the cup represents my blood, which has been shed for you. And I'm going to pray, and as I pray, I want to invite you to consider what it looks like to participate in the meal that Jesus has given to us. And when I'm done praying, the ushers will be at the front of the room with the elements for any who did not pick them up in the lobby, and you can just raise your hand, and you can receive a, copy, or a piece of those elements so that you can participate in what Jesus has done for you and what Jesus has done for me. We can be united around his word and united around his son, Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we begin to focus our heart's attention on who you are and on what you've accomplished, I pray that you would move in us in powerful ways, that you would allow us to see clearly. Father, may we be a people who have united around Jesus Christ, around your Son who is revealed perfectly in your word, not only revealed in your word, but who has come to us as the word. For in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. This living representation of the words of God is found in your Son, Jesus. Father, may we make straight the path to him. And may any who does not know what it looks like to live a life of obedience and surrender to him, may they find hope and freedom and release today in coming to him. To lay down our burdens. To lay down our shame. To trust that you are able to have your name exalted in that time. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the work of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? And as we stand together to be dismissed, we recognize that we are uniquely called out as a people of God to be given a mission in order to serve him in this world. So my encouragement to you, my charge to you, is to witness to Jesus, witness for Jesus, and the way that you live your life outside the walls of this church. God bless you. Have a great day. 